Now, if you talk about the categories of effective field theories, if you look at the list that I get handed out to you, or the list of things we're going to do in the course, then there's really, in general, two ways that effective field theories are used. So the two ways are from the top down or from the bottom up. So we'll start with the top down. So in the top down situation, you know what the high energy theory is. I'm going to keep using this language of masses where I have a high energy and low energy theory. And we'll think about it more generally when we come to examples where we need to think about it more generally. So in this top down case, we have a high energy theory, say the standard model. And that theory is understood in the sense that we can write down the Lagrangian for it. But we're not satisfied with that. We find it useful to have a simpler theory. To do some low energy physics. Or even to do some high energy physics where not all the degrees of freedom of this, of this high energy theory are relevant. So we're in a situation where we have some theory, which I'll call theory one, which is this high energy theory, that we understand it, that we can think about doing calculations in it. But we want to go over to some other theory, which I'll call theory two, which has less degrees of freedom. And we're making expansions. And that's a low energy theory. This is the high theory. This is the low theory. So that, that's what we are in this situation of what we call top down coming from the top, from high energy down. So what do we do? Well, in this case, it's kind of nice because we can actually use the fact that we know this theory one and can do calculations in that theory one to even think about constructing theory two. So what we can do is we could just start calculating things in theory one. and integrate out, i.e. remove, the heavier particles. And in, in doing that, we can do what's called matching onto the low energy theory. That means we can use this ability to do calculations in the high energy theory to find what the operators are of the low energy theory just by direct calculation. And also, if there's new low energy constants that show up, we can calculate the values of those constants by using information and connecting them to the high energy theory. So in this case, we're able to use calculations, really, to construct the low energy theory. So just schematically, I start with some high energy Lagrangian. And I go over to some low energy Lagrangians, where there's an infinite series, which I've indexed by n. And that index is to denote higher order terms that are less relevant in whatever expansion you're doing. So just to be general, I'll say it's an expansion in decreasing relevance of the kept terms. So if you're in this situation, then these two theories are, in some sense, describing common things. The high energy theory describes more than the low energy theory, because you've removed something in constructing the low energy theory. But the two theories have to at least agree where they overlap. And so they have to agree on certain infrared observables.
which I will also often denote as IR for infrared. The place where they differ is in the ultraviolet. So they might have different ultraviolet divergences. Often, most often they will have different ultraviolet divergences. They don't have to agree in the ultraviolet. And actually, you exploit that to do things with the effective theory that you would be hard to do with the full theory. And we'll talk about how we do that later on. So the fact that they differ is actually not necessarily a negative thing. It can be a bonus. And finally, you have to ask about this sum over n. Well, this sum over n is infinite. It goes on forever. And so you have to ask the question, when should I stop? And therefore, you have to look to experiment and see how precise they are, or just to your own perseverance, and, and figure out what level do you want, what precision do you want in your description. So what n do you want to stop at? Sometimes experiment tells you only do the first two ends. Sometimes you have to decide, maybe I only want the first one. If you're doing it for the first time, I suggest you start at, stop at the beginning and let someone else do, this, do the corrections. <laughs> this, is, this idea of doing this can be important for separating physics of the high energy theory. One example of this is in QCD. If you take QCD for just about any process, there'll be some parts of it which were perturbative and some parts of it that are non-perturbative. And by doing this kind of thing where you expand, you could construct a low energy theory that only has the non-perturbative scale in it and removes all the perturbative scales. If you did that, then just doing this procedure would allow you to figure out what is the non-perturbative physics and what is the perturbative physics. You'd separate out, in that case, into operators. You'd separate out the infrared physics. You'd have operators built out of the infrared fields. And those operators would describe the non-perturbative physics. And you'd have some new low energy constants, which would describe the perturbative physics. And some of the examples that we'll do will make use of that, probably. So that's kind of a motivation, actually, for, for some of the examples in the standard model. So if you think about, for example, integrating out heavy particles, like the W or the Z or the top quark. One of the motivations is sometimes what I just said, to separate out perturbative and non-perturbative physics. So that's one example. Heavy quark effective theory is also an example of this top-down effective field theory. In heavy quark effective field theory, you have a field theory for the B quark or for the charm quark. But you want to describe things like the B meson or bottom or, or the or a charm mesons. And those are objects have non-perturbative physics as well as perturbative, have mostly non-perturbative physics. And in order to do that, you want to actually integrate out the mass scale of the charm quark or the bottom quark. And if you integrate out the mass of the charm quark or the bottom quark, you go over to something called heavy quark effective field theory. But it can be done in exactly this way that I described to you, where you start with the theory with the full B quark relativistic description, and you actually just expand and figure out what the heavy quark effective theory is. So non-relativistic QED and non-relativistic QCD are also examples here. And soft collinear effective theory, one of our main subjects, is also an example of this type. Where we can just start in QCD do an expansion and get the effective field theory. So what's the other category? So the other category is from the bottom up. And typically, in this case, you're interested in using effective theory logic, but maybe you don't know the high energy theory. You don't really know anything about it. Maybe we've never probed it. That's one way in which bottom up effective field theory shows up. Or it could be that the high energy theory is known, but actually doing the matching calculations to integrate out the degrees of freedom to do those calculations explicitly could be just very, very difficult. 
maybe it would be non-perturbative, for example. So if the matching is too difficult, then you may also be, want to be thinking in this bottom-up framework, where you really just start by thinking about the low-energy theory without worrying about what the high-energy theory was, or without thinking too hard about the high-energy theory, and in particular, without doing calculations in the high-energy theory in order to motivate the low-energy theory. You may not have to need, need to know some things about the high-energy theory, like you need to, may need to know that it's Lorentz invariant, that it has certain gauge symmetry, that it's not totally crazy. <laughs> but you don't need to know it at the level where you would actually carry out calculations with it in order to construct the low-energy theory. Instead, you think about the low-energy theory from the bottom up, where you can just devise it based on the symmetries, based on your power counting, and based on identifying the degrees of freedom. So, construct this series simply by writing down the most general operators that we can think of. consistent with whatever degrees of freedom we have, and of course consistent with the symmetries of, that we're imposing. Okay, so the picture is that you don't know, or you want to remain agnostic about theory one, but you still are interested in constructing theory two. If you do this, then unlike the other case, the couplings that you have when you write down these operators, they all are multiplied by some couplings if they're higher dimension operators and they're not constrained by gauge symmetry, then all of those couplings are unknown. But you can fit them to experiment. So the effective theory may still be powerful because you can make more, than, more predictions than the number of parameters that you have like for hydrogen, where we have very few parameters in the, the effective theory, but we can make lots of predictions from non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Or it could be in the case where you, the matching is too difficult that maybe you have to carry out the matching numerically, like with lattice QCD. Um, and so that would be another possible way of determining couplings. And again, the desired precision tells us when to stop. So it's important that we have a power counting for this theory, that that power counting is in some sense defined irrespective of what the full theory was, so that we can stop even in, this, in the bottom, uh, uh, bottom up case. So what are examples here? Well, the classic example of this type is Carl perturbation theory, where you're thinking about a field theory for kaons and pions, and doing the matching onto kaons and pions from QCD is a non-perturbative process. So you think about constructing the effective theory just from low energy and from symmetries, knowing the symmetry breaking pattern in particular, uh, and you construct the Kyle perturbation theory without thinking about doing the matching explicitly. So that's one example. Another example of this type is actually the standard model itself. If you think about the logic that we used when we construct the standard model, it was exactly this effective field theory logic. He said, what are the relevant degrees of freedom? Electron, quarks, W bosons, <laughs> listed them. We wrote down, we said, what are the important guiding principles? Gauge symmetry. <laughs> How and then we wrote down the most general Lagrangian that we could think of, and that was the standard model. Okay, so it's an example of a bottom up effective field theory, we don't ask questions about what's higher up when we write down the leading order Lagrangian. And we can actually construct higher order terms in the standard model, expanding in the idea that there's physics above the scales of the standard model, and write down higher dimension operators and 
have a real standard model that has an infinite series. Okay, so the standard model is an effective field theory that has an infinite number of operators. And we'll talk about that momentarily and as well next time. So that'll be, that'll be the first example we actually treat is the standard model is an effective field theory. Another example is quantum gravity. If you take Einstein gravity and you make it quantum and you allow yourself to expand, i.e., you say you're only interested in low energy physics, so you allow yourself to write down an infinite number of operators, then you can also renormalize that theory order by order in those, those infinite number of operators. And so it's also an example of something that you can treat from this effective field theory paradigm. OK, so important stuff. Is there any question about that? Sits well with everybody. Makes them feel good inside. OK. So, so far when we've been talking about this sum over n, we've been really thinking about expansions in powers. Some mass scale divided by some other scale being much less than 1. OK, that's what we've meant by it. But when you have two scales like this, m and lambda, you also get logarithms. So it's not always powers. There's also logs that show up. And this comment I meant about, that I made about ultraviolet divergences in the low energy theory, it can actually help you to understand those logarithms. Continue over here. So when you treat the renormalization of the low energy theory, as you know from quantum field theory, the, the, there's what you have different types of divergences, power divergence, but just is, but the logarithmic divergences in particular are things that are playing an important role often in quantum field theory. And in effective field theory, it's the same thing. Logarithms can be tied to the renormalization of the low energy effective theory. And allow us to some infinite series of those logarithms. So often, just the power counting and the renormalization of the low energy theory will actually allow us not only to calculate the logarithms, but to think about summing up infinite series of, of those logarithms. OK, so that was kind of just elaborating on a point I made earlier. And again, I should say here that I've said this in the language of there being two masses, m1 and m2, and w over mb. But this is actually true more generally again. So I actually make a claim that there's not any log that you've seen in quantum field theory that shouldn't be possible to figure out an effective field theory that allows you to understand those logs and predict logarithms at higher orders in perturbation theory. There's not, a, there's not an example in quantum field theory that I've met that hasn't fallen into that rubric where some effective field theory description allows you to understand the logarithms. Okay. So that's kind of a bonus. It's not the guiding principle. It's not what we're doing when we're expanding in powers. But it's something that we get along for the ride. And maybe it would be the motivation. If you, if you see some logarithms in some process and you want to understand them, then maybe you would say, well, well, I'd like to understand what effective field theory would give rise to a description where I could understand those logarithms from a renormalization perspective. And sometimes that's very useful because Maybe those logarithms are phenomenologically important, and you want to make predictions about higher order logarithms. Or maybe there's controversy. When I was a graduate, or when I was a postdoc, there was some controversy about a term that was alpha to the 8 log cubed alpha in hydrogen energy levels. OK, 8 powers of alpha, 3 powers of logs. There was four groups. Two of them had got one answer. Two of them had got another answer. And using the ideas of effective field theory, we were able to figure out that one of those groups was right, the other was wrong. 
very clearly because you could connect these logarithms uh, to an effective field theory and then the whole consistency of that effective field theory really allows you to, to connect this logarithm to other logarithms and really to build a, uh, a picture for what's going on with the physics that makes it totally clear what the answer must be.